So I think we can start. Sharon, we ready? I think you can open your microphone. So welcome everybody. This is the first online webinar of a series of webinar on iFlow nasal oxygen, nasal cannula organized by Hamilton, which we thank. I have to let you know that uh, the session is, the webinar is recorded for your privacy, I let you know. And uh, that we still want to be interactive, uh, even though we are online and uh, you can't uh, speak up directly. There is a question and answer button that you can press and uh, um, ask your question. And we will have at least one poll uh, asking you uh, what your opinion on some odd issues or topics of this uh, talk. So we will try to be as interactive as possible given the limitation of the online. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Sharon. Sharon Ena is professor in anesthesia and critical care at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. He has a master in clinical epidemiology, so intensivist and epidemiologist. She is notably the past chair of Intensive Care Scientific Committee of the European Society of Anesthesiology and the current, is in the current uh, one of the three Cochrane editors for anesthesia, intensive care, and emergency medicine. So she has done a lot of research in the emergency medical field and also collaborated with uh, many meta-analyses and, cri and critical reviews uh, for iFlow. And she is a good friend and a very brilliant and intelligent <laughs> person. So this is much more important than the titles. <laughs> And I leave it this to her to start with some a short presentation, which will kick off our discussion. Please, Sharon, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start by uh, sharing my screen. Hopefully, if it, if it will let me uh, share, I'm trying to figure out how to do this at this very moment because I'm having a technical problem at exactly the critical moment. I, um, if I may suggest, perhaps run the um, survey first. We run the poll, perfect. So I will launch the poll. You, uh, the, the, the question is, when do you use iFlow as first line treatment? And there is no correct answer. All answers are maybe correct. And especially we want to know what you do in real life or what you would like to do in real life if you don't have uh, iFlow. So I launched the poll now and please answer, everybody answer, you can choose multiple answers corresponding to what you actually do because we want to start from where we are, not from where we should be, which maybe doesn't even exist where we should be. What we are is much more important. So please vote. We leave another minute or so open so you can read them all and vote. Meanwhile, Sharon, try to fix your problem. Oh, it's fixed. It's, it's fixed. fixed. Yeah. So 39 answer, 42. We have 127 participants, so we are almost half answered. Let's see how it goes. So it's one minute, we leave another 30 seconds. This is everybody's opportunity to speak up. So please tell us how you use your high flow oxygen therapy. We okay. really keen to know. And if the, all the answers are correct, we close the webinar because you already know everything. <laughs> <laughs> we see. So we are uh, at 75, 10 seconds more, please select. Okay, well, we can close, I think. Okay, I close now and, and uh, I will share the results. So everybody should be able to see the results now. Do you see them, Sharon? Yes. So you want to read or I read as you would prefer? No, you go ahead with it. I'm going to be talking a lot in a minute. Okay, when do you use iFlow as a first line treatment? So iFlow is this high flow of oxygen and hair in the nose with humidification. And the 
We can start from the most, uh, with the majority of vote went to patients with COVID-19, very interesting, 79%. Second, in, uh, second arrived uh, patient with acute hypoxemia respiratory failure, 78%. Third uh, is a patient with post-extubation respiratory failure. So not just post-extubation, but with the diagnosis of respiratory failure after extubation. Then third is a post-operative patient at risk of pulmonary complication. So right away, you extubate and you put high flow, even if you don't have a respiratory problem. Then there is in patient with hypercaptic acute respiratory failure. Then we have a patient with congestive heart failure, very interesting. And last is postoperative patient, low risk of pulmonary complications. Okay, we can, very interesting. So the main is COVID hypoxemic and post extubation with some hypoxemia. And you want to go uh, on with your presentation and keep in mind sure. the result. Let me share my screen now and just make it um, presenter mode. Just a minute. Give me one minute, Perfect. please. Put uh, the presentation. Yes, it's in presenter mode in one minute. There you go. I hope everybody can see that. Um, so uh, our topic is uh, right patient, right treatment and right time. I'm going to be giving a little bit of background on each of these topics. And then we're going to sort of have some free talk about um, how to do it right, given uh, the data in the, in the guidelines. So uh, these are my disclosures. I just thought I'd put them up there. And, um, and now that I have shown these, uh, I'd like to start by pointing out that respiratory failure is not a single disease and it's not a single disease. Um, and, and that's really important because when we're talking about respiratory failure, we want to possibly provide different treatments for different targets and we I'm, and I'm going to mention some of these uh, going forward. So which types of patients you've seen? Um, these are uh, the patients that we've mentioned, hypoxemic patients um, and, and the subgroups within these could be patients that are non-immune suppressed or immune suppressed, patients with hypercarbia, uh, which is really important because uh, we didn't point that out. That is a, a problem within the guidelines, I'll mention that. Post-operative patients, um, high and low risk, post-extubation patients, again, high, low risk. In post-operative, we'll see that there is also an issue with the type of surgery. Uh, during intubation is another question. And, and then there's a the question of maybe situations involving additional systems, uh, such as shock, sepsis, heart failure. So these are all very different conditions where we can use or not use the, um, the um, high flow nasal oxygen. Now, just to mention, for example, here, uh, talking about uh, benefit, uh, rates of post-operative post respiratory complications will differ depending on the type of surgery. And not only that, they, it will depend on additional factors, which I'm going to show now. So when we're discussing abdominal surgery or thoracic surgery, the risk of complications of airway or respiratory complications is higher when we're talking about thoracic or cardiac surgery. And potentially the benefit could be greater if the high flow nasal cannula or high flow nasal oxygen is effective. So when we are reading these papers or looking at these analysis, it's important to remember that the benefit is very relative to the amount of risk. And having said that, this is how I would put the escalating systems for delivering oxygen for uh, starting with a nasal cannula and showing the oxygen percentages that you uh, get per each, uh, per each step that you're giving. Nasal cannula, face mask, going up to 15 liters per minute with uh, approximately 40% oxygen. Face mask plus a reservoir, Venturi masks, and then going to high flow and then finally escalating to what I would call BiPAP rather than CPAP, uh, which uh, are slightly different because uh, with BiPAP, you're talking about two levels and CPAP, you're talking just about a basic uh, expiratory level of, uh, of pressure. So these are different modalities. Every single one of these is a different step in terms of escalating system for delivering O2. So we're used to thinking about these systems this way, but also when we're talking about the guidelines, you have to remember 
that there are um, different devices and high flow nasal oxygen devices are only part of it. You can see here the characteristics of the different high flow nasal oxygen devices. Uh, I'm showing proposedly more than one device because there are more devices um, available on the market, although this is, uh, as we mentioned, a Hamilton session. And um, it's important to know that these devices do differ somewhat in some of their characteristics. And there are comparative studies looking at what percent oxygen can be uh, achieved with different types of flow, but there are not a lot of studies on this. Um, and, and that's important to know. Um, so you're welcome to look those up. When we compare them, then what are we comparing them to? Are we comparing them to CPAP, BiPAP? It could be in fact that we're comparing oxygen, um, uh, different devices altogether, and therefore the results of the studies differ. And then there are, are additional questions that relate to the interface. So again, comparisons are definitely confounded by questions related to these things when we're talking about the uh, guidelines. And finally, before I actually get to the guidelines, I'd like to highlight in what hands. And you know, in my hospital, thankfully, I can say that we have excellent respiratory technicians that are amazing and they help us and they know far more in terms of the te technicalities than many of the doctors. But there are places where this service doesn't exist. And it's a huge difference when you have this type of service and you're capable of asking for this type of support. And when you're talking about the guidelines, we have to remember that many of the studies came out from centers that do have this expertise. So the question of applicability is always a good question. So, and finally, uh, going to the right time, I'd like to highlight two studies, and I'm going to mention the guidelines right after this. Uh, the first study is a study that was uh, published in intensive care in two 2015, saying that um, in fact, at this time, um, uh, when patients that had failed, but were intubated late with high flow nasal oxygen did worse. So in fact, if we wait too long, we might actually be putting our patients at risk. And there's another study showing very similar findings on uh, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, uh, showing uh, that the trial was stopped early because the death rate was higher because of delayed intubation. And again, um, these are one was a single center study, another uh, an RCT, and, and there, may, there are major differences between this, the studies, but the concept is important not to be too late with intubation when that happens. And the right time is a major determinant here, talking about 12, 24, maybe even 48 hours. So here are the guidelines, and you can see that we're talking about um, originally the 2017 guidelines only for non-invasive ventilation, which really didn't touch upon high flow nasal cannula. And then later on, um, 2020, there were two guidelines that appeared uh, the guidelines that we wrote uh, for the um, for the plug together with the European Society of Intensive Care for the role of high flow nasal cannula and the second one that relates to uh, non-invasive respiratory support in general discussing comparisons both of these 2020 guidelines have various comparisons so um, I would like to stop at this point uh, and rather than run through another 300 questions and slides and so on uh, why don't we just do some back and forth and have, um, you know, questions and answers related to the various situations that we uh, had mentioned before, starting perhaps from hypoxemic, um, the hypoxemic. Uh, Sharon, I would uh, favor live and online interaction. So there is a question from the audience that is online now. So Annalisa B., it's, uh, she asks, uh, there is, it seems no evidence support for high flow for pre-oxygenation before intubation, but I have positive experience. Would you recommend it? So we start from a little from the end, but uh, I think this is a real question, so we should answer. Absolutely. So um, in the 2020 guidelines that uh, we studied, the, uh, the ones uh, written, with, uh, written with the plug group with Graham Rockworth, we actually did address this question and we looked at what's out there in the literature. And you know, there is uh, the literature is very limited. I have to say, uh, we uh, found no evidence to support 
uh, high flow uh, nasal cannula, uh, nasal oxygen, but I want, and, and I really think it's important to understand the limitation of the data on this. Uh, first of all, all of the studies, except one which was conducted in intensive care, the apnea time was shorter than two minutes. And so um, that's a major problem because when we are looking at these patients, patients with a decreased functional residual capacity, such as patients with obesity, pregnancy, um, in fact, uh, have re really fast hypoxemia. So you'd expect within two minutes to see something, but not necessarily. The only study, there was only one study that had a um, apneic ventilation of four minutes. And that, uh, and there weren't sufficient, there wasn't a sufficient number of patients in that study and the comparator wasn't strong enough. So I would say that we're really missing data out there. And I would agree as a clinician from my experience, definitely for patients with hypoxemia. Um, and I would definitely consider, and I and think it's important to consider it for uh, patients with obesity and pregnancy. Um, if you think that the FRC is low, because the, the data really isn't out there. And okay. we're looking forward to your studies, people. And um, going back to other questions that are from the audience, but before the webinar, sent before the webinar. So it's so easy to use iFlow. Why shouldn't it be the standard for any patient requiring oxygen in the hospital? So, you know, I it, this is a, an interesting question because- Is it um, only an economic problem for you? It's, uh, first of all, there's the question of oxygen consumption. I don't know, um, you know, we've talked about, um, uh, we've seen this happen during COVID, you know, what's happened to the hospital oxygen consumption. It's not just an economic question. It's how much are we actually capable of providing to all the questions to all the patients. And the second thing is that um, not, every single patient absolutely needs it. So patients, for example, in the post-operative setting, if you ask me whether in another maybe 10 years, each, uh, each uh, uh, spot in the PACU may have a place for a, a high flow nasal cannula, uh, that's a possibility. Particularly, you may have like three spots for high-risk patients where um, post-operatively you might want to have that option. But not every single patient needs that because, um, for example, a stroke patient that needs just three liters per minute really doesn't need that modality. So we should still be cautious. It's, not the, it's not the iPhone of medicine that everybody should have it. It's no, a, no, it's, it's wasteful. Be. Okay, so there is another live question that was posted online now, and is what is the role of eye flow in our failure? Any data on uh, in I didn't heart hear you. failure? Heart oh, failure. in heart failure. Okay, that's that's an ex excellent question, actually. So um, you know, this is this is uh, um, one of the interesting questions because there is quite a lot of literature showing that uh, CPAP and BiPAP in heart failure is actually very beneficial. So for patients in pulmonary edema, we nowadays know that the first modality would probably be uh, BiPAP or CPAP. And actually we had one in our unit uh, a few days ago, which was a very dramatic improvement. You know, we had a discussion, high flow CPAP. But, um, you know, if you put, um, and, and, but again, you need the technical skills, okay? So if you have a center where nobody knows how to use or you don't have the ability, then it's then using high flow is better than nothing because it's very simple. It's probably not the best solution. My, to date, do you know of any study testing randomized trial on uh, our failure? Yeah, so there's actually, I think it's the Greco study uh, that where they complain, co co they actually compared the helmet CPAP to, uh, to high flow nasal cannula, and they showed that uh, helmet is better. Um, so uh, unfortunately, you know, uh, uh, again, this is a study conducted by people with great expertise. I mean, I'm happy that these people are conducting these studies, but it's not like, um, you know, in the middle of Africa where you can say, you know, I have nothing else and is this better than that? Okay. These people know how to use this, this tool. Then this is in line with the integration versus escalation of therapy that you mentioned in the beginning of your presentation. So another question is, can you use it at home? 
Is there any data on patient uh, outpatient? Yes. Uh, for heart failure or for general, in general? I think general, yeah. No, so no. high flow nasal cannula, absolutely. I mean, there's, um, uh, you know, I think with the COVID-19 pandemic, we've seen that uh, patients are using high flow even at home. This is happening uh, as we speak. Uh, it's preventing a, a arrival to hospital. I think if you put a pulse oximeter on a patient, the patient's cognitively intact, and there is somebody there to watch the patient. And I'm highlighting this because, you know, this shouldn't be a patient sitting at home uh, alone. Then I think that absolutely we could, uh, that, that is a modality that um, if you can prevent hospital arrival, uh, exposure to secondary infections, yes, there is sufficient literature. Uh, I would say actually today, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, there's more literature on the AIRVO than on other uh, types of high flow nasal cannula devices or nasal oxygen devices, but it's a possibility, yes. And there is even a little bit of literature coming, you know, just beginning to drip in on ambulances. So that's an interesting. Outside of the hospital. So another question, I think this is uh, something that you see when uh, you go around that, that uh, someone puts the high flow and a mask on top of that. I think it can, and the, and the, and the question is, uh, I applied this method, I flow with a mask on top uh, with mixed result. Is there any data? I think the fear is uh, FiO2 that you use the mouth, uh, open, close. What, do you, what are the data on, uh, on the right patient, uh, depending on how he or she breathes? Okay, so so I would say um, it's interesting that uh, that um, in this um, it's it's a, this is an excellent question because high flow the per, the proportion of oxygen in the inspired air is completely dependent on how the patient is breathing and I think um, in when uh, you're going to uh, listen to the uh, uh, lecture on the settings of high flow, then I'm sure. Um, Who's doing that? I don't know. Uh, then I'm sure, <laughs> Tommaso, you will have a lot to say about that. Um, uh, so uh, there has to be a, uh, a uh, how shall I put it, a, a match between how the patient is breathing. And what, what, and what the patient is receiving. And if the flow of the patient, for example, is more rapid, the inspiratory flow, than the uh, flow provided to the patient, there will be entrained air. And the question is, are, is the, will the patient be entraining air or additional oxygen? So if the patient has excess respiration higher than what is provided by the high flow, which is very rare, by the way, because it's actually planned to provide the maximum level, then uh, an additional face mask could help. And that's just, you know, putting that in proportion. Okay, then there is a question, I think it's very interesting on uh, risks. So is there an issue of oxygen toxicity on the lung, someone Adon is, is asking, and more in general, I would like to ask you about risks that uh, in the randomized control trial, if there were any complication of this uh, treatment. So I think risk number one is delayed intubation, which I've already mentioned. I would say risk number two is the fact that the high flow system is a, is a system that basically is completely open and does not have alarms. So, you know, and we have seen this in COVID wards, if the patient sits, for example, on the tubing then, uh, and disconnects, there will be no alarm um, and, the, and the, the patient can become hypoxemic and nobody will know. Uh, the third question I think uh, of risk would be psili, which is um, probably, a page, uh, you know, a spontaneous lung injury uh, caused by, a lack of coordination between the flow of the patient and the flow of the de device, inspiratory, expiratory, and probably compared to CPAP. And again, this is an assumption. There is a very little literature on this, uh, and I'm sure that we will hear about this in settings, but um, uh, there, is, there is some evidence of psili in pediatric and neonatal cases, less in adults. And I would say on lung oxygen toxicity, 
less data, almost nothing really. Okay, then uh, Greg asked if there is any data on COPD patient uh, treated at home with the high flow. So I do know that there, um, there is a very preliminary data showing that COPD patients uh, with high flow um, actually have decreased work of breathing. These are very, uh, I've seen two very preliminary studies on this and, um, and I would hesitate to say that this is a first line modality at this point, but there is definitely need for more research on this because there is some promise particularly in this group of patients. Then there is my friend, Richard, asking, is there any data in using eye flow during resuscitation? This is also your topic of research. Oh, that's can, very interesting. Before okay. the patient is uh, intubated. Okay, so we are going back to the apneic ventilation question here. And the patient is already apneic. And uh, during CPR to add high flow to the inspiratory flow, that is a fascinating question. Uh, perhaps, uh, you know, you know, I'm actually unaware of any, um, like definitely RCTs, but uh, observational studies showing any difference. Have so you the, should contact you to perform the study. Yes, you? please, let's do that. Okay, <laughs> then there is a, a Question by Ricard Ninson saying interhospital transport, sometimes uh, humidification may be a problem. Would you use uh, high flow without humidification? And if so, for how long? If there are any data on the level of humidification or humidification, yes or no? So yes, as you saw uh, in the slide at the beginning, and yet, since this is recorded, you will be able to see that. And if you wish, receive these flight slides as well. Uh, humidification level is a very critical uh, component of the high flow uh, nasal oxygen. One of the limitations in providing oxygen in high flow uh, was in the past the fact that humidification was not possible. And that sort of creates an effect like, you know, if you're driving with your car and your head outside the window, please don't do it at home, then you feel the dry air coming at you and it's very unpleasant. And the humidification allows not only an increase in a maintenance of temperature, but also improves the tolerance of the airway to the high flows. So if you're talking about maybe like a five minute transfer or a 10 minute transfer, possibly uh, it's, it's doable, but more than that, I would say mm, you lose all the effect of the high flow tolerance. So another, uh, Mattia is asking, um, in their hospital, they don't have a reservoir ma mask. And so they pass directly from nasal cannula four or five liters to high flow. Do you think this is um, correct or you recommend that they try to change their practice? I think that there's a big difference between a, uh, a simple nasal cannula and a high flow. Though they both go into the nares, there is a huge difference, and uh, I would definitely recommend to try a face mask with reservoir. And by the way, you don't have to have a face mask with a bag. You can uh, uh, you can even put like uh, little horns and make a hole in a regular face mask, and it would you would work as long as the it's an open system. It would work as a reservoir as well. And you're welcome to contact me afterwards. I can draw it for you and explain uh, how to do it. Um, it, it's quite cheap, actually. So there are two questions by an anonymous attendee and by Jose Maya on the flow setting. This okay will be more the topic of another webinar, but I would like to ask you, in the large trials, uh, did you see or do you think that setting made a difference? Or Because we still mostly speak about uh, I flow yes or no in the trials, but uh, sometimes it's delivered in different ways. So based on the large trials, do you think setting make a difference or is it just high flow or no high flow? So uh, the large trials, uh, basically what we did, we, we had this question when we set out to do the meta-analysis and we looked at all the trials and mapped what they did. And basically anything above 30 liters per minute is high flow. 
So uh, if you're talking about making a preliminary setting for the high flow nasal cannula, make sure you start above 30 liters per minute and that would make it high flow. Anything less than that would be possibly something you could argue about uh, or uh, maybe more appropriate for weaning later on. Um, so that would be the cutoff and that's what we saw in the large trials. Okay, then Dr. Krujna Moapatra, sorry if, I, if it's not correct, the, the reading, uh, is asking again about the open mouth, closed mouth. So if you breathe with the mouth open, you may lose your uh, peep effect. W what would you recommend for this? You, do you in Israel uh, keep an eye on patient and telling them close your mouth as soon as they open it? Or is there a way we can uh, address this? So uh, there are, I think, two or three studies. One is actually very, very interesting. Uh, I don't, I'm not presenting it here, um, showing that um, if the patient is bigger male and with the mouth, uh, uh, with the mouth uh, uh, open, then their peep is lower. So ideally for the high flow nasal cannula, you should be a small woman with your mouth closed. Um, and this is, I'm making this obviously as a joke, but um, in- but The risk in, is that you fly from the bed, you start flying. Exactly, you, you, could, levitate. Exactly. you could levitate, yes. <laughs> uh, we know, we know, for example, that when in neonates, you match the, the, uh, the uh, uh, actual nasal cannula to the size of the nares, then uh, you can actually generate real peep that is appropriate, but for adults, we're talking about anything between a peep of three to at most eight, nine. So the peep is less crucial. We do, you know, for a very borderline patients say, you know, don't talk, don't waste your effort, close your mouth, rest, and just put your effort into the breathing. But that's always true for weaning or for post-extubation patients. Okay, thank you. So we already reached uh, the half hour that was supposed to last, but uh, there are a Last two questions, I would say, if okay for you, Sharon. So there is one on the comparison with the NIV. The Jagan is asking the oxygen, oxygen consumption, is there is a difference? In, more in general, I would say, do you see NIV and uh, iFlow as a, an integration, as something that can collaborate, or it's either NIV or iFlow? especially in your clinical practice? So I, I can say that we definitely in COVID patients, and I think we started by looking at, at the um, uh, data, at the, at, the, at the survey that you did, um, we, we alternate. Uh, we alternate, we, we see what the patient tolerates better. Uh, we see what, the, what, the pa what uh, affects the work of breathing of the patient, whether anything improves the respiratory rate, the patient reports increased comfort with one or the other. It's very difficult to tolerate CPAP for prolonged periods or BPAP for prolonged periods. So we let the patient rest on the high flow uh, nasal cannula. And we know that, uh, we know that this is uh, uh, probably the best way to integrate. The work of breathing is obviously less when you support the patient more, which happens with BiPAP, but still, um, I, th I believe personally from our clinical practice, if you're looking at longer periods, alternating the two methods is the best. So there are already uh, a lot of thanks, thanks, thanks. And uh, for you, Sharon, and there were more questions posed before the, the, the webinar that will be answered in some way, maybe at the next webinars, maybe we can write something on the website. So. Remember to sign up for the uh, next webinars. And I think uh, I think we can close this. We can close here. What do you think, Sharon? There are other questions, but we, it's just the beginning. There are more questions on PEEP, more questions on, uh, on uh, flow and PCD, but we are just at the beginning also of knowing this therapy, knowing this treatment is very new, I think, and very potent. So we look forward for your next work summarizing it. Sharon, do you have any closing remarks? 
Uh, no, I think that this, uh, you know, uh, the physiology is very interesting. We're still studying it. Um, uh, Tommaso, you are a leader in, uh, in these, uh, many of these studies. And, uh, and I think that we very much look forward to additional papers on this, and we will be moving forward with additional analyses, more summaries of what's coming out. I, and the, and uh, I, I highly and I really warmly suggest attending some of these um, seminars because many of these questions that have been asked will be covered. So, uh, yes. And uh, the, the idea of this webinar is to stimulate discussion, not to close, because uh, we are still at the beginning. So I think we can uh, close here. It's uh, 3.35 in Milan. And uh, I say good afternoon to everybody, or good night, or good morning if you are anywhere else in the world. And see you at the next uh, webinar. And thanks to Hamilton for this uh, great opportunity. Ciao, Sharon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.